plain in the scriptures, very easy to understand, very simple. As we look at it, thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, for your understanding and patience with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so first, we must note here about this text is that, is that Stephen, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. I think that's the most important thing to understand about any man that goes through trials. He needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost or woman. He needs to be. Stephen was going through the greatest trial of his life here. And the Bible says that he was full of the Holy Ghost. A man that is full of the Holy Ghost has heaven on his mind. If you, if you see what it says here, this earth and all its toils and cares and sorrows will try to captivate a man, try to take his mind away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. But Stephen's account shows us that he being full of the Holy Ghost, what did he do? He looked up. So a sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost is to look up, is that our, our thoughts and our hearts and our, of our minds are to look up. We may be saved but not filled with the Holy Ghost tonight, saved by the grace of God and on our way to heaven and everything else, but it is, it is the, the duty of every born-again believer to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It is your absolute duty as a child before God that you are filled with the Holy Ghost. It is your duty. It is your reasonable service to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Absolutely. It is not what the tongue-speaking crowd and the others have tried to make it out to be. It is not that complex. It is not something that is out of the child of God's reach. Listen to me tonight when I tell you this. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is not out of the child of God's reach. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you've been through. It is not out of your reach. If God commands you to do something, then it can be done. Amen. It can be done. If there, is, if, there, if there is a command for the child of God to do it, then he can do it. Otherwise, God wouldn't command him to do it. But doom and gloom may cloud our profession and our walk with God sometimes, and we are tempted to look around us and see the world waxing worse and worse. You know, sometimes our gaze is upon the world and what's going on around us, and this causes great discouragement. Causes great discouragement to have our minds and our hearts captivated with what's going on around us. Amen. We've got to be careful about that. It will not help us to be filled with the Spirit. If our eyes are fixed on a fallen world and an erring brother or comparing ourselves among ourselves, well, so-and-so's life is better because of this, or I don't have this in my walk, or I don't have that in my walk. Well, God never told you to have what they have. God told you to be filled with the Spirit. That's what he said. He commanded you to be filled with the Spirit. Not to compare yourself, well, I want to be like that person, or I want to be like that person, or have faith. You know what? You're who God makes you, and you need to submit and, and yield to the Spirit of God and be filled with the Spirit right where you are. Amen. That's God's demands on our lives. That's what God expects from us. When our thoughts become too much within ourselves, we will become morbid, like I've talked to you about before, which I understand full well. While it is true we should apply the lessons of the Bible to ourselves, that's only if it is applicable. You know, sometimes we, when you, if you go through any anxiety or depression like that, you, you automatically think the worst thing about everything. I mean, your mind just naturally just floats there. Whew. Right? It's like you automatically think like the worst thing, <laughs> worst thing in the world about any situation. It just goes there right away. Absolutely. Right away. No questions asked. And you may give, you'll give a thousand people the benefit of the doubt, but not yourself. Nope. Right? That's how it is. But God doesn't want us to be that way. We need to be filled with the Spirit, not filled with ourselves. Amen? While it's true that we, we, we need to, if we're not careful, we'll take the Scriptures and we'll apply things that don't belong to us. You might be eating a dookie sandwich if you're not careful. <laughs> right? Or you might get yourself a gomer. Right? <laughs> which, were, <laughs> which, were, which, by the way, were signs unto Israel, not examples for the church to follow. Remember that. They were signs to prove God's working, not, oh, I think I'll go get a gomer. Or I think I'll go eat a poop sandwich. Right? That's, that's not what God told you to do. So you got to be careful about reading things in the Scripture. Be like, well, that applies to me. Well, does it? Right? Does it?
But in this, we understand that looking up is the answer. We have to look up. And now how better to look up than in prayer? This man, Stephanie, was filled with the Holy Ghost. Did you know that filled with the Holy Ghost is eight times in the King James Bible? Eight times. The number of the new man, resur- uh, the resurrected new man, the regenerated man. Listen, what does that tell you? That tells you and I that God expects his people to be filled with the Spirit. God expects all of his children, whatever you're going through with in your life, whatever trial, whatever tribulation, whatever heartache, whatever pain, whatever physical ailment, whatever it is, what, you ought to be filled with the Spirit. God expects his children to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Signifying that the new man should be filled. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse number 5. Stay in Luke chapter 1. We'll have a couple verses there. Four or five verses. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 5. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Well, that means he was perfect, right? Because he couldn't have ever done anything Wrong. Wait, no, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Means he knew he was a sinner and he needed the Lamb of God to take away his sin. Right? And remember, he's the same man. I thought about this, like he's the same man that got very anxious and very fearful while he was in prison. Well, how could it be so that a man filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb could have that happen? Because he was still a man. And the Bible says much about John the Baptist. He was what? Greater, greater than what? All the prophets, yea, I say, and more than a prophet. Among women, that's right. Think about that for a second. But he still had his fainting fits, didn't he? You and I will still have ours, too. Amen. But that doesn't mean you can't and you're not filled with the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean that at all. We need to understand that. Being filled with the Spirit is not just feeling good about, not feeling good about ourselves. It's feeling good about Christ. <laughs> it's looking to Him, not us. We ain't got nothing to be happy about in ourselves, that's for sure. And if we do, it's definitely tainted with something. Amen. Luke chapter 1, verse number 41. His father said, and it came to, or Elizabeth said here, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So joy is a sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Joy. It doesn't mean always happiness, but it's joy. Joy is long-lasting. Joy is something that someone cannot really steal from you. You can lose it for a while. You can have the joy of thy salvation taken away, the Bible says, and it is at some times. Sorrow can fill your heart. There can be times of that where God deals with you and does that. I have seasons of that myself right now, and that's what God has put me through and told me to, that showed me that's where I'm at right now. But that is not forever. Elizabeth spake with a loud voice. It says, boldness is a sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. A boldness. But I want you to understand something about that. That Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost in her home. She was in her home. She wasn't out preaching in the public. She wasn't standing in a pulpit. She was filled with the Holy Ghost. And guess what it was centered around? Making babies. You catching that yet, or do I need to help you? What is my point? My point is this, is that that's the promise of God that he made in 1 Timothy 2.15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. That, That the place for a woman is in the home, and the place for her to be filled with the Holy Ghost is in the home doing what God has called her to do. That was the proper place for her to be. So being filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't mean that you lose all of God's order. You go around and do whatever you want to do and say, well, I'm just following Jesus like Beth Moore, the whore, and the other ones out there that are doing the same thing. Usurping authority. Sorry, Paula White's the whore. Beth Moore's the Jezebel. (laughs) Sorry, wrong one. It did rhyme, but (laughs) I want to be accurate at least. She's a religious whore. I'll put it that way. She's a Jezebel. 
It's not very nice. People don't like that, but that's okay. It's the truth. When they find out their churches are all ran by women pretty soon, and they look up one day, and all these women are running around running things, and then the trannies are running things, and then and, and then all the sodomites are perverting all the kids, and all that stuff is happening. Then they're gonna then they're gonna remember those mean old preachers that said you can't do that here. Somebody, somebody's just got to be bold and mean enough to say it. That's all. There always has to be that old bony man, that bony man, the old finger sticking right at you and saying, nope, no, not here. You take that circus down the road somewhere, but you ain't doing that here. Same thing I tell Kanye West. You take that circus down the road somewhere else. Don't be, you ain't playing that circus here. $250 sweatshirts. Saying Jesus is king on it. $250 sweatshirts. Right. Him. That's all about him. Look at that album that says Jesus is king above it. Kanye West. I don't know, man. I know he is. I know exactly what he's doing. I know exactly what he's doing. He's reinventing himself right in front of everybody to see. Him and that crazy psycho wife of his that worships devils and, is, and, and visits mediums. And people are like, well, he just doesn't, look, he, Kanye doesn't really understand Catholicism. Man, that guy can sit down and teach you Catholicism. He is an absolute scary genius is what he is. I made sure I told J.D. Hall, too, that, that if it does happen, that, that nobody needs to punch himself in the face. Sure, I put that on there. So, so he understood. Don't, that's not necessary. That's not necessary at all. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so spare me the feminist teaching of being filled with the Holy Spirit makes a public preacher and, and a woman to usurp authority over a man. Because it doesn't. It doesn't. It never has and it never will. But that makes people mad. See, if, people don't want you talking about those issues. Yeah, because it is real. That's right. And when you're talking about being filled with the Spirit, you can't ignore what the Bible shows as being very clear. Luke chapter 1, verse number 67, And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Being filled with the Holy Ghost causes us to prophesy or preach the word of God. He preached of mercy and righteousness and the coming of Christ the Messiah. He preached of those things and the work of God. Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with tongues, right? So what happened there? With other tongues. What happened there? Ancient languages. Other languages God gave them. I find it interesting that, that all the charismatics, though, uh, are similar to those that are, that are exercising devils in Rome which Satan doesn't cast out Satan. He just, they just play with the devils is all they do. That's what the Roman Catholic... Listen to the, the show I did on exorcism today. They, they just play with devils is all they do. That's what they do. They, they play with them. They bring them out and get people... Get, right. Right. Exactly. That's what happens. But anyway... Here they spoke in national languages as a sign to Israel. The gospel would go to all the world. They were filled. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 8 and 31, what do we find? Preacher uh, Peter preaching with boldness. The preacher's preaching with boldness, right? Because he was filled with the Spirit. Acts 9, 19. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then Saul, who is called, who is also, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Acts. Yeah, that, that's Acts 13. I'm sorry. Acts 13, verse number nine. Turn there, please. I got ahead of myself. It happens sometimes, Malachi. I know you can relate. Acts chapter 13, verse number 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? 
And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then, when the, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, turned to Jerusalem. Now if Paul were to do this today in the church, or out evangelizing, the brethren would be sure to say that he wasn't very Christ-like. Wouldn't they? Look, Paul, you can't be telling people they're, they're devils. They're full of all subtlety, all mischief, child of, children of devils. You can't tell them that. Now you're, you need to act more like Jesus. But the Bible says here that Paul did that when he was full of the Holy Ghost. Do you understand that? So there's a principle there. You know, I balance that with, with what Paul said um, in, in, uh, when he said, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. There's sometimes you've got to square your shoulders up, look at somebody, and get right in their face and deal with it. There's sometimes that has to happen, right? Especially with those that try to subvert people with the gospel. There's a time that that needs to be done. And that's what Paul was doing there. When you get people like that. I, I've had to do that with people before, and it chased them away. Because I just looked at them, and I, and I was done with it. Everybody was trying to deal with them, and they wouldn't stop. And I just looked at them, and I, I just laid the ax right to the root. Done. Bye. See ya. And they leave. Why? Because there's no more. It's over. And sometimes you have, to, you have to know when that is. You have to know when the right way is to do that. In this case, it was, the speech was always with grace seasoned with salt. Salt burns sometimes. Sometimes it burns. Salt's a preserver, but it's also a burner too, isn't it? Sometimes you've got to pour some salt in that open wound. Sometimes you have to. And that's what had to happen. That's what had to happen here with this man because he was subverting people. It's like, you want me to liken it to somebody? The flat earthers. You can be talking about something, preaching away, and all of a sudden on there out of nowhere, somebody like the flat earth, the flat earth mafia comes through and just like plops down and just starts talking about the flat earth. Why do you believe NASA? When did I believe NASA? The Bible says, God sitteth on the circle of the earth. NASA didn't teach me that. God taught me that. I mean, I learned that from the Bible. Right? But what do they do? They want to subvert. They don't, you could be preaching the gospel and they'll come up with a flatter. I mean, that kid, when we were out preaching, wh who was there? He came, did he have a flat earth outfit on? He, ha he was covered from head to toe in flat earth gear. No, there's like a flat earth mob, dude. It's like gangster flat earth. I'm not kidding you. This was last week when you, you, didn't, you weren't there. He walked up and he was covered in flat earth stuff. Like he was like the flat earth, like they have flat earth preaching gear or something. And he was like, he's an evangelist for the flat earth, right? Yeah, he has a card and he's an evangelist for the flat earth. Well, the evan evangelism means the good news. It's, it's actually the, the news of Jesus Christ. It's not the shape of the earth. I think you've been subverted. Oh, he left. I don't know. He left. He said he listens, and I'm not trying to be mean to him. I'm just telling you that you've been subverted. It, there's two words you should look up in the King James Bible. Vain jangling. Because that's what it is. That's what it is. Vain jangling. Right, so sometimes you just have to look at those guys and just be like, no. You have to. There are times to do that. Sometimes you have to answer more straightforward. That doesn't mean you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean that you're wrong with God. It just means that sometimes you have to do that. That's what Paul had to do. There are examples of that in the Scriptures. Jesus did it many times. Plus, you know, a lot of people... If we would slow down and read the Bible the way God wrote it <laughs> and understand it that way, there would be a lot of times you would actually see the sarcasm that is used because there's a lot of it in there. There is a ton of it in there. Paul used it all the time. I mean all the time. And Jesus, he got his digs in on people. 
but he did it for them to think. He didn't do it to be mean. He wasn't doing it just to be, but he did it for them to think. Right, he did. I mean, he did. And and if you don't read the Bible like that, you just read it straight through, you read it very dry. Right, right. He, he, he said, have you not read? I mean, well, of course they read. They read the whole thing. Well, what are you reading? Like, what exactly did you read? He should have said it nicer. When he called them a generation of vipers, you synagogue of Satan. Now, that's not everything he said, and it shouldn't be everything we say. Most of it should not ever be like that, but there's going to be a time when that has to come. So weigh your words wisely. If you're doing that too much, then you're not balanced, right? And a false balance is what? An abomination unto the Lord, right? Amen. Next, false notions of being filled with the Holy Ghost. We should talk about that. <laughs> One false notion that is out there is that you'll resemble the drunkard when you are. And when I first started preaching, I believe there were some similarities. Now, I there's... But not like Rodney Brown or the, the crazy drunk guys. I didn't believe that. Right. Hagen and all those other guys. The drunk on the spirit guys and all those guys. They went, they, I didn't believe that. But I thought, I heard some things that when I studied it that, that showed that, oh, some of these people have like, or sometimes you're filled with the spirit. You, if you're drunk with wine, you're very talkative. If you're filled with the spirit, you're very talkative about the Lord. So some of those things are not bad comparisons in that sense but not like what they're talking about, like acting like a bumbling fool or a drunkard. He's not saying you're going to act like a drunkard. That's not what he's saying there. He says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but what? Be filled with the Spirit. There's a contrast. He said, don't be drunk. Don't, don't be a drunkard. Be filled with the Spirit. And he shows us in the Scriptures what that means to be filled with the Spirit and how that looks. When God's people, by the way, God's people should stay away from liquor. I know you know that, but I think I always give a shout out to that, and uh, no pun intended. But, uh, but for, for people to understand that that's the position, that's my biblical position, always will be. If you drink booze, then you're a drunkard, and you're a fool, and you're going to get caught up, and it's going to get you. And when it gets you, it's going to get you good. Proverbs, that's right, you, you are not wise. Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. You know, this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do a, an OPBC live on this sometime and just, just hit this really good for all the Alkies out there. Well, for all the, the, the recreational Christian drinkers out there that believe they're right, yeah. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent. If you have ever been drunk, you know what that means. Yeah, it biteth like a serpent, and it stingeth like an adder. And it does. That's right. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Boy, is that ever true. Whew. Thine heart shall utter perverse things. Isn't that true? You ever heard a drunk's mouth? Well, yeah, you have. When we go out street preaching, we hear it all the time, don't we? Listen to the drunk's mouth. Listen to what they say. You saw those guys sober. If you saw those guys sober in the middle of the day, some of those are probably businessmen, executives, other people like that. They're, they're, they, you would go to work with them. You, they would never talk like that. But what happened? They got liquor. They got drunk. And when you get drunk, you do perverse and wicked things. And I'm going to tell you something. You, that's exactly what happens to the drunkard. He does perverse and wicked things. That's what he does. Right? So the Bible says, be not drunk with wine where there's excess. I thought I'd throw this in here and talk about alcohol a little bit, lest somebody should think that, that, that we've backed off on our principles, what we believe here, and, that they, and a strong warning for anybody that you shouldn't be drinking booze at all. Yea, thou shalt be he, as he that lieth, lieth down in the midst of the sea. 
or as he that lieth on the, upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou sh shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Was it used as medicine? Yes. Still maybe in some cases, I believe. But not administered by yourself. And in very extreme cases. But for people to drink booze casually as a beverage of everyday choice is a fool's errand. And you'll turn yourself into a sloppy, foolish, stupid drunk. Amen. You ruin your life. You ruin your life. And others. I've got two dead relative family members that I, one I never knew was my uncle, the other my grandmother that died. What'd she do? What was her great, what did she do that was so bad? She got in the car with her, with her sister, I believe it was, wasn't it her sister? Got in her car, they're both in their 80s, were they? 74, and, and you're, and you're, she was what, 82 maybe? I mean, they were excited, having a good time, hadn't seen each other for a while. They were driving out to my aunt's house. Some drunk came through with a, with a van going about, what was he going, like 60 miles an hour? Yeah. He was doing like 75 on that back country road, slammed into them, bodies flew out of the car, instantly dead. Sound like something to play with? Sound like something to play with, kids? You better think about it, kid. Someday you're going to grow up and somebody's going to try to uh, set that wicked liquid in front of your face and they're going to try to tell you, hey, you know what? One won't kill you. Oh, yeah? Tell that to others. Tell it to those that have already died. Tell it to those that are in the morgue. Tell it to those that are in the grave. Tell it to the family members that are weeping and crying because of their dead loved ones. Because some idiot got in a car and thought it was smart to go drink booze and kill himself. Tell that to the person that has alcohol poisoning that dies choking on their own vomit. Amen. Trying to scare me? Yeah, I am. I hope I'm doing it too. I hope you think about it. I hope you remember what I said. And don't be a fool. Amen. The Bible says rather to be filled with the Spirit. Adam Clark said this. He said the heathen priests pretended to be filled with the influence of the God they worshipped. It was in these circumstances that they gave out their oracles. Instances of this quoted in, in, in note were the case of the Bacchanalian. Right? Was that, is that a, how you say his name, Bacchanelli? Is that how you say his name? Bac, Bacchus or the god of wine and revelry? Yeah. He was the god of wine and revelry. So, in other words, these charismatics are really taking on that spirit. When they act like they're drunk in the spirit, and if I had a if I had a video and a projector screen, I could show you that, but I'll cover it sometime. But uh, that those they walk around drunk. Yeah, Pan, the god Pan, that's who it is. Perverts. And what are these charismatics that do these things? What do they end up getting into? Fornication, perversion, homosexuality, the same things this Bacchanalian feast did. The same thing that those false gods did. Spiritual harlotry and physical harlotry. Why? Because that's not the God of the Bible. The apostle exhorts the Ephesians not to resemble these, but instead of being filled with wine, to be filled with the Spirit of God. In consequence of which, instead of those discoveries of the divine will to which in their drunken worship the votaries of Bacchus pretended, they should be wise indeed and should understand what the will of the Lord is. So you shouldn't be filled with liquor. You should be filled with the Spirit. You shouldn't be filled with spirits, but the Holy Spirit. That's it, isn't it? Those... By the way, those, those guys that are doing this drunk in the spirit thing, those guys right there, they're filled with spirits. They got spirits. What's that? Yeah, they call it an anointing. They're getting one all right. 
Albert Barnes said it is not improbable that in this verse there is an allusion to the orgies of Bacchus or the festivals celebrated in honor of that pagan god. He was the god of wine, and during those festivals, men and women regarded it as an acceptable act of worship to become intoxicated and with wild songs and cries to run through streets and fields and vineyards. To these things the apostle opposes he says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as much more appropriate modes of devotion would have the Christian worship stand out in strong contrast with the wild, dissolute habits of the pagan. Think about that for a second. That's the total opposite of what the charismatics do. They run around wild like the Bacchaleans. They run around wild like that, but he felt the spirit is not wild like that. It is not. That's a lie. It's a sham. It's a false spirit. That's right. Power and of love and of a sound mind. That's right. Plato says that while these abominable ceremonies in, in the worship of Bacchus continued, it was difficult to find in all Attica a single sober man. Think about that. He said they couldn't even find a single sober person. Think about that. It is. But we're coming to it. We're coming to it. Where you walk down the street, how hard is it when we're out preaching to have a sober conversation with people? It's well nigh impossible. Yeah. Yeah. No, she said, no, it's not. Yep. Yeah, they, yes, they changed the public intoxication rules. Now, you can get, now you can get disorderly conduct. But not, but you have to do something, but not just being drunk. Right. That it was not uncommon in those times to become intoxicated on wine and that it was positively forbidden. All intoxication is prohibited in the scriptures, no matter by what means it is produced. There is, in fact, but one thing that produces intoxication. It is alcohol, the poisonous substance produced by fermentation. This substance is neither created nor changed, increased, nor diminished by distillation. Uh, it, exi it exists in the cider, the beer, and the wine after they are fermented, and the whole process of dis distilling consists in driving it off by heat and collecting it in the concentrated form and so that it may be preserved but distilling does not make it nor change it alcohol is precisely the same thing in the wine that it is in the brandy after it is distilled in the cider or the beer that is in the whiskey or the rum and why is it right to become intoxicated on it in one form rather than another since therefore there is a danger of intoxication in the use of wine as well as in the use of ardent spirits why should we not abstain from one as well as the other? How can a man prove that it is right for him to drink alcohol in the form of wine and that it is wrong for me to drink it in the form of brandy or rum? It's a good argument. So these men that walk around saying they're drunk in the spirit are a bunch of fools. One man said it this way, there, there's a spirit above and a spirit below, a spirit of joy and a spirit of woe. The spirit above is a spirit divine. The spirit below is the spirit of wine. So anyway, these bunch of devil-possessed uh, charismatics are not filled with the spirit. That's not being filled with the spirit acting like that. No, it's filled with spirits. And they mimic the, those feasts to Pan and others, other false gods that were out there. I like what this man said. Was any man ever made a better Christian by the use of wine? Was any minister ever ba was any minister ever better suited to counsel an anxious sinner or to pray or to preach the gospel by the use of intoxicating drinks? Let the history of wine drinking and intemperate clergymen answer. Amen. So, how are we filled with the Spirit? It's a good question. It's probably one that you may be wondering about. How how do we fill with the Spirit? Well, there's a few things that, that, that the Bible lays out for us. And I would say that, number one, it is obedience. That when you see what the revealed will of God says for the Christian, that you obey it. What is plain, not what is secret that I'm not sure of, not what the future holds, but what the revealed will of God is, that I obey it. That I follow the revealed will of God right away. Amen. Amen. In order to, to our being filled with the Spirit, says one, we must be aware of the magnitude of the blessing. This supposes also that we have a relish for the blessing. We have to desire it. 
We should desire to be filled with the Spirit. We should not desire a mediocre Christian life, but we should desire one that is filled with the Spirit. Amen? We ought to desire one that is filled with the Spirit, not mediocre, not just getting by, not just, not just uh, um, living, but living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and being filled with the Spirit. That ought to be every Christian's desire. It ought not be that you and I are okay with mediocrity in the Christian life. We ought not be, just, we ought not be okay with just, just getting by. Amen. But we ought to have a desire to be filled with the Spirit of God. We should have that desire in our hearts. Amen? Let me say this to you. In order to be filled with the Spirit, you must make room for Him. What do I mean by that? (sighs) You're too full of yourself. (laughs) I'm too full of myself. There's no room for the movement of the Holy Ghost uh, to fill me. Not that he's not there. He's there because he saved us but and regenerated us and made us new. But to be filled with the Spirit, we got to be emptied of self. Well, should we not take the lesson from the man that was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb? What did he tell us? He must increase and I must decrease. He must increase, and I must decrease. You know, you and I would have stronger assurances in our faith and everything else if we live by that principle every day. He must increase, and I must decrease. Well, I would take that good advice from a man that was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb that would definitely have some understanding of that concept, wouldn't he? He would have experienced that for many years of his life. That he must increase. I must be emptied of self. So didn't Jesus tell us that? Didn't Jesus tell us that we must deny ourselves? You know, when I think about denying myself, I think of all the ways Dave could deny himself. Right, Dave? Don't you do that? I mean, you think of the the comfortable ways to deny yourself, like some of the comfortable ways, right? There's some comfortable, easier things that we can do. But you know, when it comes to denying my feelings, when it comes to denying my anxious mind, when it comes to denying my bad attitude, when it comes to denying those things, I have a little bit of a problem with that. Does anybody else have that same problem? Huh? Yeah. I think we do, don't we? It, it's hard to deny ourselves. That's why Jesus said, though, you have to deny yourself. Before you could take up your cross, you've got to deny yourself. Now, Paul said something very plainly, and I'll probably repeat it again. Paul said, I die daily. You know, I always thought it was once when I got saved, and then, you know, fundamentalists always tell you you need to give your life to the Lord, and I believe that, okay? But... That's not a one-time, the the sad thing is they've turned it into a one-time decision at the altar where you do that. (laughs) I hate to break it to you, but it's a decision you make every day, hourly. Denying of ourselves is hourly. Denying of ourselves to be filled with the Holy Ghost is hourly, and it's very, it's painful. It's not a one-time decision. Well, I did that back when I was so-and-so. you got to do it today. you got to do it now. Paul said, I die daily. Right? He said, I die daily. And you might be thinking in your mind right now, well, I think I've died enough. you got to die some more. Every time I start to feel like that, it's like the Lord puts me in the furnace and heats it up a little bit hotter. <laughs> Stoke it up a little bit hotter. And I'm serious. I know it's happening, right? You know what I'm talking about. It's happening. Okay, well, I can see you're not quite done yet. Right? (laughs) That's the way it goes. In order to be filled with the Spirit, you've got to deny your flesh. Now, that's to be a disciple, but, you know, we, we like to take back our lives, we, we like to take them back. We do. We do. We like our own way. We like to be comfortable. We like to be comfortable. 
yeah, we want people to like us. Well, I don't really, but but not anymore. <laughs> I used to, but I gave up on that. <laughs> it's a lost cause. It it kind of went away and <laughs> just kind <laughs> of just gave up on that. What's that? Not my calling to be liked. I, What's that? Not enough likes. You know, not going to happen. But I have other areas that the Lord deals with me on, you know. And, but in order to be filled with the Spirit, you have to be subject to the same ardent desire. You got to have that desire. In order to be filled with the Spirit, we have to yield ourselves to His influence. We have to yield ourselves. We must give ourselves up to the guiding of His, of his agency, of His leading. How do I do that? Well, Romans 12, 1. See, you right about now you're thinking, what is this mystical teaching that I have to, how do I yield it up? Is it to my feelings? Well, I don't feel good today. I don't feel saved today. I don't feel this today. I don't feel that today. So I have to do this or I have to, no, 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 no. It's not, no, no. See, you know, God is using, sometimes God lets our feelings fail us. I mean, many times, especially mine, um, in, in order to bring us back to this. It really is. It's to bring us back to thus saith the Lord. Not, well, how do you feel about that? I'm starting to learn, Dave, that no matter how I feel about it, it's always going to be true, no matter how I feel. Now, I knew that, and I know that. When I got saved, I knew that. And the longer I live, I know. But God showed me more. Well, yeah, but when everything in this flesh and everything turns against you, this is still true. God's word is still true. And be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I was reading yesterday a very good book that I'm going to tackle. 2,000, it's got like 2,400 pages worth of material in it. It's like that big. It's the Christian in Complete Armor by, um, I forgot his name, Grinnell, William Grinnell. And it's huge. It's double columned. But I started reading in there, and he started talking about that, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, that it is God's might, right? And he said, one thing that he said about it is that you and I always, we, we believe that God is almighty until we get into a, a trial. And then we, we start questioning, even the, the greatest saints will start questioning God's might. Well, why would we do that? Because we're fallen creatures. Amen? And God wants us to believe us when we're in the fiery furnace. Wants us to believe him when we're in the fiery furnace. God wants us to believe him. Wants us to believe in his might. I like what, and, and to have some, for lack of a better term, where's Pete at? Is he here? Pete's not here, is he? Pete, you here, Pete? All right, you're here. We got to have some spiritual grit, Pete. Right? I like what he said. Uh, he said about this wo the woman at the well, or no, the woman at the was it the no it was the woman that um, came to him the Phoenician the Syrophoenician women right? She came to him and she said he, he said that that uh, it's not for you know the children to give their meat to the dogs or whatever. And 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 she, yeah and, and Grinnell said. She took, those, she took those bullets that Jesus shot at her, put it back in her gun, and prayed and shot them back at him in prayer. And she did. She said, yea, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And that's what God wants from us. That's the violent taking it by force. That's, that's not being passive in prayer. It is the violent taking it by force and believing God no matter what. Amen. We have to yield ourselves. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Yeah, good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Sorry, I was looking at that. Make sure I didn't misquote that. Um, by the way, that's all one will. Well, there's three different wills. There's the good, there's the acceptable. Well, if it's good, it's acceptable. If it's acceptable, it's perfect. That's how God works. It's not three different wills. Let me break that up into three different wills. Okay, well, I'll follow the good. I might follow the acceptable. 
I might just, I might just look, I might just not follow the, the perfect will of God for my life. That's stupid. <laughs> like, how do you even start a conversation like that for real? Like, okay, well, well, there's three different wills here. <laughs> so which one do you want? Pick a card, any card. I mean, it's like, that's not going to work out well for you. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So, like, what do you set somebody up to say, well, it's acceptable, might be all right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Some 30, some 60, some 100. But it says to yield yourselves unto the Lord. He, Paul is begging us by the mercies of God that we would present ourselves. Living. So if I don't want to be filled with the Spirit, I present myself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. It is your reasonable service. You present yourself, and then you are not conformed to this world. But you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I renew my mind? Right here. Amen. And then I can be filled with the Spirit. Thomas Manton said this. This means, the means how we come to be filled with the Spirit, certainly, number one, it is from God, who is the author of all grace, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Number two, that God doth it through Christ the Scripture also witnesseth, which he hath shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. That this time of heart, number three, that this time of heart is wrought in us by the Holy, by the Spirit or Holy Ghost that come down from heaven is evident also in the Scriptures. It is given us by the Gospel, or that for what is, for that is called the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that they may be free from the law of what? Sin and death. He said the Gospel worketh two ways. If any have this power and spirit of the Lord Jesus, it is the mere favor of God. If any want it, it is long of themselves. So if, you, if, you don't, if you're not filled with the spirit, it's your fault. It isn't God's. It isn't God's fault. You're not, God didn't make you deficient in some way when he, when he regenerated you and he made you a new creature. He didn't make you deficient in some way where, well, you need something else. No. Amen. He says this, one, one of the means is prayer. Christ had taught us to pray for the Spirit. Jesus taught us to pray. He taught us to pray. The more you pray, the more you'll be filled with the Spirit. Have you not, have you not prayed and then saw God strengthen you? Have you not been strengthened through prayer? And, as God, and, and it is bold prayer. It is, it is bold prayer. That does that. And it is God's Spirit that leads us into that bold prayer. And sometimes God allows us to be so far downcast that we will separate ourselves from every man and we will call unto the Lord in spirit and in truth. And we will cry out to Him and we will spend time with Him and we will be strengthened by Him and filled with His Spirit. Let's take a practical. Uh, turn at this. If someone is full of something in the Bible, it means they are consumed by it. Consider these terms. The end of all flesh has come up, come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. So they, the earth was filled with violence. What did that mean? They were filled up. Their hearts were full of violence. That's what was in their hearts. That's what they feasted on. That's all that their heart wanted and desired, Right? For my loins, David said, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. There is no soundness in his flesh. That's after David fornicated with Bathsheba. God gave him a disease. That's another one that's just as bad. You're going to fornicate. You ain't going to get away with it. Amen. You ain't going to get away with it on God. Nobody gets away with anything with God. So then if my mind and heart is full of something, full of violence, be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess. Don't be filled with wine, right, but be filled with the Spirit. What does the Bible say about the backslider in Proverbs 14, 14? The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. What does that mean? It means that the backslider, his, his heart is full of, Whatever he wants to do. So what's the opposite? I, I fill myself up with what God's word says for me to do. 
That's how I'm filled with the Spirit. I fill myself up with God's, what, what God's Word says. And if I fill myself up with God's, what God's Word says, and I obey God's Word, and I yield to God's Word, and I submit myself, then I am filled with the Spirit of God. That's God's promise. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with God's ways. It means I follow the book. It's, it's my food. It's my portion. It's my water. It's my life. Now, to be filled with the Spirit, the next point, I must practice and cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. See, in our minds sometimes, we believe, well, the fruit of the Spirit is just kind of hanging there. It's kind of there, right? It's kind of there. I don't have to do anything with it, really. Zach, I just, it's kind of hanging out there. It's like, it's like a, a cluster of grapes. And that's what it is like, by the way, because it is fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. Do you understand that? I'm going to say that again to you. It is fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. Why does that matter? Because it all comes in one cluster. Do you understand that? That means you have all of them. Let me say that again for you that aren't listening. It is one cluster. It is the fruit of the Spirit, which means you have all of them. All nine of them. Be fruitful and multiply. Right? Now, why is that important? Well, it's important for you to understand that just because you have all nine of those doesn't mean you have cultivated all nine of those. It doesn't mean that you have practiced all nine of those. A gardener that grows, uh, that, that some, when something is growing in the ground, Dave, I mean, you could have nine different types of something there growing, but guess what happens? If I don't focus on that, it's not going to grow properly, right? And then some of it may grow and some of it may not. But if I cultivate it, if I work on it, if I fertilize it, if I, if I practice it, then what happens? That's right. And some, you're going to be stronger than others. Galatians chapter 5, turn there, please. Verse number 22. If I want to be filled with the Spirit, I've got to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Ouch. You know, the Bible says the greatest of these is charity. That love, right? That's the greatest, right? Love. Man. It can be tough, can it? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, here's the next part. If I want to be filled with the Spirit, I've got to live in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, I've got to, excuse me, we already live in the Spirit and we're saved. I have to walk in the Spirit. Right? I got to walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? Practicing all those things that I just read to you, those nine, the, the nine fruit of the Spirit. Practicing those. Means you got to work at it. It doesn't automatically happen. Now, God gave them to you, but it is your responsibility to yield to those things. You're not going to automatically do that. You got to work at it. You have to work at it. You have to practice those things. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. It's all self-denial. So what is the manifestation of that feeling? We find it in, we find it in speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ought to be practicing these things if I want that. How does it manifest? Well, wife, how does it manifest? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, here's how, if I'm filled with the Spirit, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Husband, you're the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now the husbands. How does the fruit of the Spirit manifest? Or how does, the, how does me being filled with the Holy Ghost manifest in my marriage? How does it manifest for a husband? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. What is that? That's love. It's him giving himself, a husband giving himself for his wife and his family. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cle- and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. That's what God says. If you, you know, that's, how, that's how being filled with the Spirit manifests in your life. Your submission one to another, your kindness, the, the, the uh, fruit of the Spirit that is displayed. Amen? And we all fail, don't we? Right? We all say things we shouldn't, don't we? Amen? <laughs> Amen. That's right. We all do, don't we? Right? <laughs> happens. From the preacher to the people. Amen? It happens to all of us. Ephesians 3.16. And we'll be done here. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend, look at this, with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine, where there's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And if you follow God's Word, if you obey it, if you yield to it, if you learn it, the longer you learn it, if you practice and cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's God's promise. And the, and the manifestation of that will be how you treat your husband, how you treat your wife, how you treat your children, how you treat your family, your obedience to the Word of God. Amen. That's, that's God's promise. It's not a mystery. It's very plain, very simple. And the best part about being wrong is you can be right. It's the only good part about being wrong is if you're wrong, you can get it right. Amen? That's what God wants. And that's what God's desire is for us is to be filled with the Spirit. That's why he commanded it. That's what every Christian's desire ought to be is to be filled with the Spirit of God. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your church. Thank you for one another. Thank you for... The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Help us, Lord, to live for you every single day of our lives. And help us to be desiring to be filled with the Spirit, not with our own ways. The backslider gets filled with his own ways. He ignores the Bible. He ignores the Word of God. He ignores the divine revelation. Follows his feelings. Follows his heart. Follows everything else that this flesh wants. And ends up in destruction. Help us, Lord, to be filled with the Spirit. Help us to follow you, obey you, yield to you cultivate and practice and work on that fruit of the Spirit and to deny the works of the flesh. Help us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow you daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.